Welcome to week six of the Union. It's great to see such a packed chamber tonight. The fire warning and people sitting on the, on the floor is becoming a sort of tradition, which I'm really pleased to see. So thanks all for coming for this important debate. The motion before the House tonight is this House would pay reparations. This debate comes at a really prescient time. The University of Cambridge has recently launched an investigation into the legacies of slavery. And additionally, the University Council has had to return the collection of Benin bronzes to the government of Nigeria. There is no better time to revisit the question of whether Britain owed reparations to its former colonies, and I'm so grateful to our six paper speakers who have agreed to come tonight to discuss just that. Given there's a lot of new faces in the room, I'm going to do a very quick intro to debating. We roughly follow British parliamentary form style, so we have a motion before the House, and we split for and against. We've got three wonderful paper speakers on each side. They'll speak in order of proposition and then opposition. They've got 10 minutes to speak. If at any point you want to say something in that speech, you can get up and give a short point of information. It's completely up to the speaker if they want to accept, but I have strongly encouraged them to take one or two, so I hope they will. Just a reminder, point of information about 10 to 15 seconds. If you've got far more to say than that, do a floor speech. These happen after each pair of speeches, so between the proposition and the opposition. Um, I will turn to the floor, I will solicit speeches, and you can speak for up to three minutes, um, four against when I'm central of the motion. So please do get involved. These debates are important because we engage the whole membership in the discussion, and I'm really grateful for that, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, without further ado, I'll move to our first proposition speaker, and to Bel Ribeiro. Bel Ribeiro Adi has been the Labour Member of Parliament of Streatham since 2019. She's a self-described lifelong socialist and feminist, and served as Shadow Minister for Immigration in 2010. 20. Bel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. In starting, it's very important that we start with the premise that there are no amount of payments, no collection of acts that could ever recompense for the hundreds of years of enslavement, genocide, ecocide, the theft of national resources, colonialism, deliberate underdevelopment, and the forms of neocolonialism that persist today. The crimes against humanity that were slavery and colonialism were too great and the impact was too wide. But this is not an argument that we should do nothing at all. The word reparations is taken from the Latin word repare, to repair, to make amends, and I would argue that the focus needs to be on this repair, which is as much about moral and social equity as it is about financial compensation. This is what makes reparations much more about the, than the simplistic idea of handing over large sums of money to those who have been wronged. From racism to economic inequality and climate breakdown, so many of the problems that black, Asian and minority ethnic people face in the global south and in this country have their, its undeniable roots in the crimes against humanity, namely slavery and colonialism. The notion that these events are too far past is completely flawed. They are very much present day subjects and objects to the claim for reparations. The evidence of the unjustly derived wealth and how it was derived is all around us. The impoverished nations in the global south, the socioeconomic status of descendants of the enslaved, the auspices of institutions like this, um, our, our place in this, in this world, our wealthy and industrialized cities and our treasury. We cannot forget that when slavery was abolished, Britain took out a loan, the equivalent of 300 billion pounds to pay off slave owners. We only finished paying off that loan in 2015. This means that for decades, the descendants of the enslaved, indentured, and colonized, including the Windrush generation, contributed to paying their own oppressors. So other than the obscene wealth that made this small island state one of the richest countries in the world, its citizens continued to pay financially for the slave trade after it ended. Not only by doing this have the government established it was possible to pay reparations, albeit by paying the oppressors instead of the oppressed, they've established that the funds are very much in our present, as have the individuals and institutions that continue to benefit from this wealth. And it's not just the wealth, it's the wronged that are also present today. The undeniable crimes against humanity are as well evidenced as are the continued effects in the form of global impoverishment and racism. If we deny the need for reparations because, uh, because the crimes against humanity we refer to were a long time ago, that means we're denying the very real experience of the object of this claim, those for whom this impoverishment and racism exists. Lest we forget that race is an entirely social construct, 
without any biological meaning. A human invented classification system instituted and enforced primarily for the justification of owning human beings and for the purpose of free labor, subjugation and theft. When we talk about reparations, we talk about repairing this imbalance which very much exists today. And if we cannot deny that the lasting effects of the original crime exist, and that, we, that means we can identify where reparations need to be made. And further to this, we cannot eradicate racism in our society until we accept and understand that its roots are in these past injustices and make meaningful reparations for the damage caused. Yet we continue to argue against it. If governments like our own don't believe that there's a reasonable claim for reparations, then why do they continue to refuse to make the direct apology that has been called for? One of the arguments that I often make myself is that it's because we only apologise to our equals and the racism that persists in society means that a government like ours would never see people, those people that are most affected as equals. And that, that, that view very much remains for me. But the other is key to this argument because... They've expressed deep regret, they've called it a stain on a nation's history, and they've feigned every other form of being apologetic without actually apologising. Could it be that they recognise their culpability, and like your average corporate body trying to avoid paying out for something that is so blatantly their fault, they go to great lengths to ensure that they do not use the recognised legal language for liability? They do not admit fault, not because they don't believe they're not at fault, they do not admit fault because they know they are at fault and simply do not want to pay the price for this. We make so many arguments against paying for reparations when there are so many ways that we could actually begin doing it today. Simple things like returning artefacts, an end to exploitative trade, cancelling debts that impoverished nations have paid over and over again, giving those former colonies the tools to deal with the effects of, the effects of climate change, which are the, actually the product of European industrialisation, which itself was fueled by colonial exploitation. And as many will know, there is a growing consensus in the museum sector, there is no justification for holding artifacts in British museums that were stolen through force. So I was really pleased uh, to hear again today about Jesus College Cambridge taking the important step of restoring two looted Bonin bronzes to their rightful home. And Glasgow councillors recently voting to repatriate stolen cultural treasures. But there are thousands more right across this country and the ultimate loot of empire in the basement of the British Museum. Finders, keepers was not an argument in the playground. It's not one that would work for our justice system. Yet we continue to employ it when discussing these stolen items. Even to the extent that we suggested that we loan these things that we've stolen back to the people we stole them from. Restitution as a form of reparations is one that can easily be addressed. Another one I wanted to look to was climate reparations. This week, uh, COP27 was very much on the agenda. We're reminded uh, that countries, including the US, Canada, and much of Western Europe, account for just 12% of the global population today, but are responsible for 50% of the planet warming greenhouse gases released from fossil fuels and industry over the past 170 years. For the first time, COP was discussing matters related to funding arrangements and responding to loss and damage. These arguments suggest that funds will be provided by wealthy nations to vulnerable lower income countries that bear little responsibility for climate warming emissions. Things such as cancelling the debts of, uh, and, and free green energy, funds to address the direct impact of climate change are viable ways of reparations. And the arguments against reparations always seem to be about what we cannot do. The question is, why do we refuse to do what we actually can? And for those of you who would not succumb to the moral arguments for doing what is right, what I would put to you is probably going to be a very bad idea for us as a nation if we don't. As our governments continue to pander to nationalism across Europe, they would do well to remember that nationalism is not a uniquely Western concept. Many Commonwealth countries will only remember a past of exploitation and, and a present in which they're subjected to punitive IMF conditions, crippling their social infrastructure in serving the interests of more powerful countries like the UK. Countries in the Global South have their own nationalists, and every one of them will tell you that they have achieved what they have in spite of Britain's atrocities, not because of aid or the privilege of being colonised. And as we leave our largest trading partner, as we've left our largest trading partner, um, whatever your views on Brexit were at the time, I'm sure we can see quite clearly it is not working. 
We need to look to the fact that we need to reposition ourselves in the world. And we're not going to do that if we go around continuously flinging ourselves about as if there is still some sort of empire. We need to make friends. And we're not going to make friends if we continue to act in this, in this dis- disgraceful way which, which looks down on people in the global south. Because as I've said, they remember what has been done. And the longer we refuse to apologise, the harder it will be to maintain those relationships. So reparations isn't about reimagining the past. It's about reimagining a future, a future that's actually built on equality, where we work towards building the equity that was denied to people because of the empire. We can start where we can by acknowledging our wrongs, actually apologizing, actually accepting liability, and we return what is not ours. We work to address the imbalance and injustice in our society. If we can attest that something is wrong, how can we claim to hold onto the values of decency, respect and equality that we preach constantly around the world? In this way, I see reparations is not only a necessity, it is completely feasible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Belle, for such an insightful set of remarks. I move now across the floor to the opposition and to the Reverend Calvin Robinson. Calvin is an Anglican deacon, TV radio presenter, and conservative commentator. He regularly features on GMB, BBC Radio, GB News, and in print for The Telegraph, Daily Mail, Spectator, and Spiked. Calvin, you have the ears of the house. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to start with a question in return to reparations. Who pays whom? Bearing in mind that no one alive today was a direct victim of the transatlantic slave trade, and no one alive today is at fault for the transatlantic slave trade. And my opposition talks about nobody wanting to apologize. The government and the monarchy have apologized, expressing regret for the situation but they were not directly at fault, therefore they shouldn't directly take responsibility in an open apology. Wealth is never acquired justly, not in a capitalist system. And unless you're proposing communism, where everyone is equally poor, I don't think wealth ever will be acquired justly. We we heard a, a moment ago about the former colonies, and we heard the word empire and the word nationalism used in a derogatory fashion, as if they're bad things. Now, without, without nationalism, we don't have a national society. We don't have a border. We don't have a country. There are those that would propose, there are those that would propose we ha- should live in a globalist society where we don't have borders and countries. I, I think that would be a bad thing. Give way. Very good, very good. I would argue that I'm not, and I would argue why, because on the, on the point of colonies, if we look at the data, rather than speaking to anecdotes as my opposition did, if we look at the latest data we have from the former colonies, such as where my family are from, Jamaica, the vast majority in the latest polls suggest that they would have preferred to have remained part of the British Empire. Now, it's quite easy for people in... in a metropolitan city like Cambridge to stand up and say, well, of course these people in the colonies wanted to be separate from us, etc., etc., speaking on behalf of people. But when you actually ask the people on the ground, what did they prefer, being a part of the British Empire or being, being separate from it? The vast majority said part of it. And why is that? Why is that? I'll give way in a second. Why is that? That's because the empire was not entirely bad, no, nor was it entirely good. The, Brit- the British Empire brought hospitals, schools, charities, Railway, lots of other infrastructure, Christianity, the English language, to the rest of the world. Right.
Okay, that just proves my point. We shouldn't listen to anecdotes, we should look at the data. If you can give me a data that shows that, I will listen to you. Give me some evidence that suggests that. I've looked at the evidence from the former colonies that is in favor of remaining part of Britain because Britain brought a lot of good to the world. Let me, let me get a bit further on and then I'll give some more point of information. So back to the question of which I started with. Who pays whom? Are we suggesting that the government pays money to black Brits in an apology for the transatlantic slave trade? That seems to be the premise. Therefore, that would suggest that, well, first of all, there's no such thing as government money as we know. It's taxpayers' money, which would mean that people in this room would be paying money to people like myself. That would mean that people that are hardworking but not necessarily getting paid much would be paying very rich and successful black people in this country. Poor black people paying rich black people. That is not reparations, that's an injustice. Who would pay whom doesn't make any sense. There is no pot of money to give to a certain demographic. And where do you draw the line? And why is it, why is it that we're always talking about the transatlantic slave trade? When, when if we look at the demographics of this country, 3% of us are from a black background. 7%, so more than double that, are from an Asian background. Why are we not talking about reparations for India, Pakistan? Why is it specifically the transatlantic slave trade? And I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why. Because it's popular, because it's fashionable, because post George, because post, because post -George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, it's only fashionable to talk about reparations in terms of black people when there are lots of other minorities around the world that should be part of the conversation. We see it in every aspect of this debate. I, I used to be a school teacher, and I, a lot of the time people would say we need more black history on the curriculum. Never, not, never more Arabic history, never more Asian history, never more Egyptian history, always more black history. Why is that? Why that particular demographic? Why should we not be raising everyone up to the same platform? That's the question I propose. It's become somewhat of an obsession. Now, you only have to look at my, my sector, the church. This year, the Church of England has proposed setting aside £2 billion to pay in reparations for the church's links to colonialism and slavery. Forgetting, of course, that parliamentarian William Wilberforce, his, enti his entire involvement in pushing, strongly pushing, the abolition movement was motivated by his desire to put Christian principles into action and to serve God in public life. And that the Christian abolitionists were the force that initiated and organized the abolition movement. Wilberforce wrote in his diary, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and reformation of morals. He, he succeeded in the first, I would argue that perhaps not in the, in the latter. Go ahead. Who does money belong to? My, my point is that money doesn't belong to people, it, it is that it does belong to people, it belongs to private individuals, and the government money doesn't exist, that's taxpayer money, that's our money. So if we're gonna give that money away to someone, we should all have a say in where it goes. But in, in terms of having more Egyptian history on the curriculum, I would argue that the curriculum isn't about skin color or, or ethnicity or race. The, the curriculum, especially in terms of history, is about how this nation came to be where it is today. So if, if, if there are significant dates and events that are affected, that align with Egyptian history, of course that should be taught, and it is taught. Egypt is massively on the curriculum. But we don't teach in terms of black history and white history. We teach, we teach English history, European history, and world history, because that is the history that shapes this nation to what it is today. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't say that. Okay, okay. So I'll get back to that. I'll get to the institution of the church because I'm, I'm, not saying that, I'm not saying that at all. If the church is going to look at reparations, what I'm saying is it needs to look at history holistically and further afield than just the transatlantic slave trade. That's the point I'm making. So if we look at the Roman Catholic Church, look at Pope Gregory. Pope Gregory the Great sent St. Augustine to this land to proselytize, to bring Christianity to the pagans. 
right? We all understand that happened, but we also know the story of how that happened. So, so Pope Gregory came across two English slaves um, in the Middle East, and he knew they were different because they were fair-skinned, they didn't look like the other slaves that he'd seen around, and he asked them where they were from, and they said the Angles, meaning England. And he could tell by their Anglo-Saxon genes that they were different to the other people. But we know by that story alone that th that's one of the reasons he sent St. Augustine to come to England to proselytize, to evangelize. Therefore, we know, as a matter of fact, that there, there has been a history of slavery all around the world. And one part of that, one, one footnote of that, is English slaves in the Middle East. Now, therefore, if we're looking at, if we're looking at history holistically, should the English, therefore, seek reparations from Rome? After all, fi five to ten million slaves propped up the Roman Empire. Five to ten million slaves. And these were not, these were not black slaves? I'll get to that. Get... <laughs> let, get, get, let me get into my speech a bit more, and then I'll, I'll take some more points of information, so otherwise I could be. <laughs> One quarter of the population of Athens in ancient Greece were slaves. So should we claim reparations from the Greeks, too? The Turks as well, the Ottoman Empire, was rife with slavery. My point on this is not that slavery is acceptable, but, but it's common. My point is that the cultural evil of slavery has always existed. It's existed throughout pretty much every national group. The difference being that we are the one nation in thousands of years that worked flawlessly hard to put an end to it. We said enough is enough. I mean, you can laugh, but that's a historic fact. Good, sir. Okay, so I think there's a crucial difference to be drawn here. Do you think that we are still suffering from the consequences of slavery in the Roman Empire versus... <laughs> Who is we? Who is we? Who is we? The global south. The, pe the, the people of eth the, the ethnic minorities here, the people who, who are descendants of the Windrush generation, they are still very much suffering from the, the impact of the empire. Do you think that is really an appropriate analogy to compare them in what way are you suffering? In what way are you suffering? You can, you can gasp and clasp your face. You're sat in one of the best universities in the world. In what way are you suffering? You are privileged. We, if we don't recognize our privilege, then we cannot help people who are not privileged. There are people around the world suffering from slavery today. Slavery is still happening. But, but people want to live in the past. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get further on because I'm <laughs> you are very mature. You're going to succeed in life. Now, after this, if you'd like to speak, please do not speak now. The evil of slavery has always existed, particularly amongst the elite. And it was the grassroots, it was the normal folk in this country that said enough is enough. We caused an uprising, we protested. And we said, we don't want it to just stop at home. We want it to stop all around the world. That's quite significant. The British people put an effort in to end slavery everywhere. We spent half a century with gunboats sailing around the world, eradicating slavery. We broke international laws. We broke the laws of the sea to abolish slavery. We were bold, we were brave, and we were a righteous nation. We composed 85 pieces of legislation in our parliament to prevent slavery in the 19th century. Nope. We spent £20 million to fund the Slavery Abolition Act. And you can, you can say that that money was poorly spent. But if that's money spent on ending slavery, I say that's very well spent. That's the equivalent of 40% of the government's total expenditure. We would not do anything like that today. So, of course, I will wrap up. Of course, slavery is an evil. One of the worst, ho most horrible acts of all nations' pasts. But what I'm saying is that it's an awful practice that has taken hold of every part of the world at some point in history. The difference being, we put an end to it, we made arguably the biggest impact on clamping down on slavery there ha ever has been, and that is something to be proud of. It cost us dearly, not just in monetary terms, but in human lives. So no to reparations, because it was a worthy cause fighting the good fight to end slavery, but we have paid that price already. Thank you very much. Please.
Before I move to floor speech, I request that everyone in this debate gets a fair hearing. I will take as many floor speeches as possible in this debate, but please make sure you make your contributions in a floor speech for a POI, not while the speaker is speaking, and that counts for everyone else in this debate. But moving forward, I'm looking for a floor speech in proposition of the motion, this house will pay reparations, and your hand was straight up at the back. You don't, it works. The one thing that most priests and lawyers and police officers agree on is that when a crime has been committed, when a wrong has been committed, a debt is owed. Now there's, there's two uh, sides often that you hear on the opposition to reparations, both in this country for imperialism and in my country for the chattel slavery evil that my country committed. You hear either that it's too big, that we can't do it, it's so monumental there's no possibility, or you hear the other argument that there were, there were good things the country did, that, that, that we brought schools and hospitals and Christianity. I'm glad Britain brought Christianity to the world. I'm Jewish, so I don't know how to feel about that, but, <laughs> but, but it's interesting. Um, but we hear that it's too small, that there's good, there's good sides on it, so that, that kind of evens out. It, it makes it all good. The British Empire was evil. And it was evil not just because it was a collection of indignities, daily discrimination, daily indignities, but it was more than that. It was more than a collection of millions and millions of them, though it and slavery were that. It was a negation of people's personhood. It was a negation of people's rights to land, to self-determination, to their resources, to their dignity. And that needs to be accounted for. It was not acquired by accident. John Steely, whose name is on the Steely Historical Library in the Faculty of History still, said that the British Empire was acquired in a fit of absence of mind. It was not acquired absent-mindedly. It was acquired intentionally and with knowledge of depriving people of their rights. And we need to pay for it, because in this society, as the many, many, many socialists in this room, even those of whom who went to private schools and grew up in country houses, as apparently all of you did, uh, the many socialists remind me, but in this, in this capitalist society, we put money is, money is where it hurts, right? Money is how we connote value. Maybe we shouldn't, but that's what it is. It certainly hurt to pay my union dues at the beginning of this year. Um, but, but we need to value it because it was evil and it was wrong. And we do inherit responsibility. I don't think there's such a thing as hereditary guilt. The, to the reverend here, I would say, the guilt is, does not, the father's guilt does not descend to the third and fourth generation of sons as in the Old Testament. But responsibility does. If you take pride in your country's strengths, you, take, you have to be ashamed of its sins. I, I'm proud of what my country and of what this country did to fight Nazism. That's why I'm wearing this poppy. I'm very proud. I'm very proud of D-Day. But I only get to be proud of D-Day if I'm ashamed of the Emritzer massacre. That's how it works. You, you get to be proud of democracy and the civil rights movement and MLK by being ashamed of slavery. That's how it works. That's, that's how a society. So, no, hereditary guilt, I don't think I'm guilty, but I do think there's a responsibility that I bear if I want to be proud of my ancestors. And I think this is true. Governments are set up for many things, some of them boring, mundane, traffic lights and laws, but sometimes they have moral purposes too. Now, for those who say that this will wash away, this won't be good, I give you two examples. After World War II, Germany paid reparations of a monetary kind to Israel as part of making up for the Holocaust. My country, in the 1990s, paid $25,000 to living survivors of Japanese internment, another evil. Does anyone here think that those wiped away those sins? Nobody would even make that argument. And yet it was right to try to do, because governments at their best can be moral creatures, and that is what Britain, that is what the United States should do. Not because it will wipe it away, but it is trying to do the right, and we should try to do the right. Thank you so much for your speech. I'm moving now to the abstention side. On the back row in the green. Uh, thank you, Lara. Um, I am, in, when it comes to voting, I'm gonna vote in proposition for this, but I wanna make this speech here today because I feel that the opposition has not engaged on the same terms as the proposition when it comes to this debate. The proposition stood up, made a respectful, clearly articulated speech about the implications of slavery, the legacies of colonialism, and the opposition stood up and insulted one of our members. And I think this topic is framed in a way that we can have a respectful conversation about reparations, about legacies, about the role of Cambridge uh, and even this institution when it comes to this conversation. But until the opposition, and I hope 
the second and third speakers will, when, until the opposition engages on the same terms in this debate, engage in a respectful and clearly articulated manner, I cannot vote on this motion or hold a decent opinion. And finally, across to the, uh, to the opposition. Just there? At the back. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm Oliver from Corpus Christi. I'd just like to try and dispel this notion from both sides of the house that the British Empire is some kind of moldy black and, black and white picture. I like to paint some of the nuances and complexities of it. So, the first thing to note is that for every sin the British Empire committed, we can point to some kind of proportionate benefit. So, we can, as has already been expounded by both sides of the house, we can, of course, quite rightfully mention the transatlantic state trade. But on the other hand, we can mention the abolition of it and the great cost and blood given by Britain over the hundreds of years since to do so. No, thank you. Similarly, I like to try and mention some of the complexities of the intercolonial relations. It is not true that the British Empire and British rule was forced upon indigenous people unconditionally. There were certain segments of societies, I'm going to use uh, some examples in a minute, that benefited immensely and welcomed imperial rule and for actively fought and spent money to sustain that imperial rule, right up to independence. I'm going to go into India now during the I, some people call the Indian Mutiny, uh, others call the Indian War of Independence. I believe it should be called the Indian Mutiny simply because half of India, on balance, supported the British Raj in combat against the revolutionaries. We see the landed classes, the elites, the Sikhs, the Punjabis all fight for Britain. Now, that's not me trying to somehow justify the British Empire. I'm not. I'm simply trying to paint it as a more complex picture, one in which you cannot simply point to Britain and say, you are reparations. You have to take into account that some classes benefited, some groups benefited, some groups wanted British rule, some groups actively fought against their own people to sustain British rule. No, thank you. And therefore, we cannot clearly say reparations must be paid. We cannot clearly make a moral case for reparations being paid. And since you are innocent until proven guilty, and we cannot clearly weigh up the balance, the scales, in one way or the other, we have to, in effect, say we cannot pay reparations because we cannot be sure they are due. Just ask a quick point of information. So I think as the first speaker said quite eloquently, um, the real reparations should go to people um, who were impoverished by imperialism. So I don't think the speaker was arguing for a reward of elites. So do you think that perhaps it'd be appropriate to revise your argument in that light? I, no, 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 no. I, I accept your point, but I simply say once again, how are we possibly supposed to know exactly which groups benefited and exactly which groups were neglected by the British Empire? It's far easier to look at countries and say, well, that colony benefited and that colony didn't, but it is impossible to look at an individual in 2022's fortunes and directly trace that to an individual in 1857. So, thank you. Thank you so much for all this intervention on the floor. Please do continue to engage the points of information on the floor speeches. I really appreciate it. Uh, moving back to our paper speakers and to our second speaker in proposition of the motion, I'd like to welcome Vaishnav Raj Rajkumar. Vaishnav is an MPhil student reading politics and international studies at Pembroke. He'll be pursuing a Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School after graduation. He won the right to speak through open audition. Vaishnav, you have the ears of the house. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the House. Tuvalu is an independent island nation in the South Pacific, comprised of nine islands. For close to two decades, the sea level around the islands of Tuvalu has been rising, giving the apparent effect that the islands themselves are sinking. Today, two of those two islands, islands are almost completely submerged, with scientists predicting that all nine islands will be completely underwater by the end of the century. A terrible situation, a horrifying and startling situation, and yet why is it that I can guarantee that most of you seated in this house tonight haven't even heard of Tuvalu? 
It's a simple answer, and it is one that will tie this admittedly long-winded introduction back to the motion. Put simply, it is the impact of an unbalanced global power structure. And if we dig deeper into the reason behind this imbalance, I'm sure you won't be surprised that we arrive at the everlasting impacts of colonialism. And as a second speaker for the government, I thought I would take it upon myself to try and extend upon our case by framing this debate as effectively as possible. And I thought I'd start by pointing out that if we're talking about reparations, while the most obvious ramifications of colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade are no doubt of the highest priority, it is the highest priority on a list that unfortunately spans across a number of heinous manifestations of imbalanced power structures that exist in society even today, including climate change. And so when we talk of reparations today, don't allow your minds to be clouded by the assumption that the reparations are only for the dastardly acts of a bygone colonial era. Allow me to show you where reparations are important, not just as a means of atoning for your past sins, but of recognizing and changing this house's trajectory from one that seems destined to be committing even more in this new neo-colonial era. That said, I would like to once again recognize that the crux of this debate is the colonialism of old that underpins this motion. As far as reparations are concerned, it is very much the original sin, and I'll be using this as my primary case study to prove my three main arguments. I have one moral and two practical standpoints. First, I'll tell you about the moral obligation of those who are unfairly advantaged to recognize and take responsibility for their actions. And yes, there still does exist this moral responsibility. Second, I'll give you some statistics on the exploitation and concerted economic and political ruin of the colonies in the last couple of centuries. I'll make the monetary argument for reparations. And finally, I'll leave you with some practical considerations on the future externalities of reparations as deterrents for policy inequalities in fields such as climate change. But before I move on to my actual arguments, I do have some points of rebuttal to the previous speaker. And I believe this is where my problem lies in this debate, because I'm just not sure where to start as far as rebuttal is concerned. The previous speaker, I think, I think the, the main issue comes up at the point where he comes up and says that we're only dealing with the transatlantic slave trade today because it is a fashionable choice. And that is the only reason why we're having this motion. A, we're not just dealing with that, we're also dealing with colonization, we're also dealing with the impacts on India and Pakistan and plenty of other colonies of the British Empire. Bangladesh. Yes, plenty of other colonies, Bangladesh included, thank you. And I think if we weren't, then I have 10 minutes worth of useless words to waste the house's time at this point. But I think it's important to also recognize on the idea that no one apparently alive today was directly involved in the colonization and therefore they shouldn't be held accountable well, what if I said that there are those alive today who are and continue to be directly impacted by the impacts of that colonization? There's a POI by the gentleman who perfectly encapsulated this. And in this way, I'll continue in my speech to show you why reparations continue to be important. There's the idea that reparation, that the acts of colonization are not entirely bad. There's the idea that we need more data to prove on our side of the house why exactly rep reparations are required. There's the idea that apparently we don't have a say in the amount that goes into reparation. But I tell you that we are a democratic nation. The very fact that we are debating this motion in the House tonight is a key signifier to show you that you do have a say and that you should vote for proposition. All the rest of my rebuttal, I'll integrate into my arguments. My first argument draws on the ideas of the principles of reparations. And it's something that I'm drawing from a speech that I first heard seven years ago from Dr. Shashi Tharoor, who was a former diplomat and currently an MP in India. The speech was by all means a tremendous success, if you forgive the fact that it was given at the Oxford Union. <laughs> this speech was so successful that it has its own Wikipedia page today. And I was adamant when I won the right to speak that I would try my best to avoid ending up parroting these arguments. And in true British parliamentary fashion, I found a loophole. I will instead extend upon his comments for this, the remainder of my first argument. Dr. Tharoor suggests that reparations are, above all, a symbolic requirement. Now, what does this mean? This can be attributed to the moral obligation of colonial powers to recognize and exceed their guilt in the atrocities of the 19th and 20th centuries. My previous speaker would have you believe this has already been done, but I tell you this isn't enough. Equally importantly, this can also result in a much needed changing of the narrative. For far too long, for instance, popular discourse on the colonization of India has been treated to a response along the lines of the following. But we gave you railways. And I'm very happy my previous speaker actually said this because it's something I had written down, and it's a perfect encapsulation of precisely why discourse needs to change. 
What I mean by this is that there is a tendency to try and make the colonial era out to be something that may have been damaging, but had its fair share of advantages for the colonies themselves. The most prominent examples are the building of railways and the establishment of telephone poles and all of that by the British in India. To this day, it's something that's talked about as a positive. But even more alarming is the realization that this popular discourse is the result of a failing education system when it comes to the horrors of colonialism. Currently, it is not compulsory for primary and secondary school students in the UK to learn about Britain's history in colonialism. What reigns instead are the misguided understandings of colonialism as not being all bad, a rose-tinted notion that often glosses over the sheer violence and brutality that characterize the British Empire and attempt to justify the transgressions of the past as not being so bad, or that they were bad conditions that we heroically helped change. And this very much hits at the center of the we gave you railways excuse. Ladies and gentlemen, it is high time that we start dismantling this harmful, muddled narrative, and we recognize the colonial era for the inexcusable horror show that it was. And so when we speak of reparations, my first argument on principle is that we do not need on-site proposition to necessarily defend the notion of an exceptionally large, complexly calculated monetary sum. What we need above all else is symbolic reparation. A payment of an amount so normal it could be as much as a single penny, but it carries with it the value of an admission of guilt and an apology for the ages. A payment that will bring the era of colonialism back to the forefront of your history classes, but in a hopefully much more accurate representation. You will no doubt have noticed that this symbolic payment, of course, has the added benefit of quelling any opposition from my respected peers on the opposite bench, that reparations may be an unfair burden on the people of Britain. But in the spirit of this debate, I will take the argument to their best, and I will explain to you why even a full, properly calculated monetary compensation by way of reparation is very much warranted, which I'll get to in my next two points of this POI. Okay, excellent. Um, this is my second argument for the evening, and um, I guess one that will perhaps cause the most distress in this house tonight, not because it is particularly controversial, but because of the sheer number of lost lives and the brutal ramifications of colonialism that is my great displeasure to detail for you tonight. During the Great Bengal Famine of 1943 in India, which resulted in the death of close to three million people, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill refused to provide aid, instead suggesting that the fault was that of the Indians for breeding like rabbits. But then consider this. How, in a country like India with an admittedly high birth rate, was there no increase in population for a 74-year period between 1860 and 1934? A question easily answered by the number of Indian lives that were lost during the British Raj in India. A number so high, it is not calculable precisely today, with conservative estimates placing it anywhere between 40 and 60 million. That's 60 million people who were forced to fight wars for the British, who were starved to death, or tortured to death, or maimed or whipped, or any number of cruel displays of a hunger for power and a great greed for an ever-expanding empire. Now, I'll certainly be there to admit that you cannot place a monetary value on the loss of life, something that Bell so eloquently put to you earlier. But you can certainly try, and anything to the contrary is nothing more than a thinly veiled excuse. And next, I invite you to look at the extent of direct British involvement in these deaths, because it's way too easy to chalk up these deaths by famine to something like natural disasters. But extensive studies show you that the effects of the famines, and yes, that's plural, famines, were directly exacerbated and sometimes even caused by the land grabs and resource exploitation of the British. My previous speaker was very fond of data and facts, so I'll give you some facts. India is a country that entered the 18th century as a major economic player, comprising 27% of the world's GDP. When it gained its independence in 1947, it contributed 3% of the world's GDP. Pre-colonial India had one of the first established forms of public schools called Gurukulas, with education considered universal for every citizen. The British left India with a literacy rate of 16%. But India is always the first example when we deal with British colonization. Let's look elsewhere. During the Second Boer War, the British ran concentration camps and resulted in the deaths of close to 30,000 Boers. Some historians believe that up to 100,000 people may have died in the Mau Mau uprisings in Kenya in the 1950s. This last case is particularly important 
since a number of the Kenyan veterans who fought in this war successfully sued the British government, who paid a sum of 19.9 million pounds to the claimants. There's an example of people who didn't like the British colonizing them. So it's not like this house doesn't have a history of paying reparations. We just need a reminder of our conscience, and that is what the proposition bench is going to provide to you today. My final argument is brief and will look to the future. Why is it that paying reparations is a good move for the world in general? It recognizes that actions have consequences. More importantly, it signals that the abuse of systemic imbalances of power can no longer go unpunished. If you've been following the news, or indeed if you've just paid attention to Bell's speech, you'll know the importance of COP27. You'll know that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak recently opened the doors to potential discussions for climate change reparations. Countries like Tuvalu have been struggling for decades to make their voices heard in these sessions. Cliched as it may sound, it is the countries that contribute the least to climate change that are hit the hardest. And of course, the ones that contribute the most just happen to be among the richest and most developed nations in the world. This disproportionate impact lays the ground for something that is referred to as right-based climate change litigation, whereby the countries worst affected, yet largely ignored in the struggle against climate change, will be able to get the compensation that they deserve. In the capitalist world order we live in, it is a sad fact of the matter that it often takes a monetary loss for many of our governments to sit up and take notice of the problem. This is the final and arguably most important impact of my case tonight. And, th and take this with you if you take anything away from my speech. That the idea of reparations will act as an important precedent above all else to guarantee and deter a further abuse of power imbalances on the global stage. And so as you walk out of those doors tonight, all I can ask is that you vote your conscience. And of course, that you walk through the door on the right. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Faith Snap, for an interesting speech. I'd like to move across the floor again, and I'd like to welcome Rafe Hadel Manku to take the floor. Rafe is an author, broadcaster, and historian specialising in British institutions, the monarchy, and the Commonwealth realms. From the BBC to ABC, Rafe is a well-known commentator in national and international media. He is a trustee of the Royal Canadian Heritage Trust and a senior fellow at the New Cultural Forum Think Tank. Rafe, the floor is yours. Right. Round two. I've been on the winning side of every d d debate, apart from one at the University of, of East Sussex over the years, but I somehow suspect that uh, this may not be following along those previous lines, but let's see how we go here. It's a great pleasure to be invited back to this august chamber uh, and to see such a full house and um, a very enthusiastic, if not energetic, crowd uh, here today. Uh, it's been seven years since I was last here, and university campuses and this chamber were rather quieter um, in those days and undoubtedly one of the factors that's contributed uh, to this increased passion is the emotion that envelops topics like colonialism and empire and I say this also as a child of empire but you know in recent months we've seen the issue of slavery and colonialism expand beyond campuses as we've now got, of course, from Barbados to Jamaica, prominent Caribbeans are also calling for Britain to pay reparations for slavery and the consequences of colonialism. And Madam Speaker, were we engaged in this debate in 1807 or 1833, I likely would have crossed the floor to support the motion opposite because, of course, the victims of the horrendous horrors of slavery would have been alive and deserving of damages. But it's not 1807, it's not 1907, it's not even 2007. Over two centuries have passed since Britain led the world as the first empire in history to abolish slavery and the right of reparations died long ago because reparations are fundamentally about matters of tort law. The purposes of damages, restoration of reparation is to restore the victim, the slave, to the position they were in before the damage occurred slavery the actual victim 
only can receive damages, not their descendants. And therein lies the rub, because some six or seven generations separate those alive today from their British Empire slave ancestors. And whilst not just yet, thank you so much. Whilst it's undeniable that 19th century slaves suffered unspeakable horrors, in what way can this lead one to conclude that their great, 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 great grandchildren are also victims and deserving of reparations too? On the contrary, from Britain to the Caribbean, the descendants of slaves today have a far better and higher quality of life than they would have had had their ancestors remained in Africa. And that's an indisputable fact. Well, if you let me carry on, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. But first I ask you, is a current descendant of a slave ethically entitled to benefit from their ancestors' sufferings? And who should pay? Is it ethical for an innocent person today to be culpable for the sins of their forefathers? Now, CARICOM, which is the Caribbean body calling for reparations, wants British taxpayers to pay. But why? Out of a population of millions, there were only 3,000 slave owners in Britain. The vast majority of the population of Britain descend from people whose lives were one of abject poverty and hardship, working in hellish conditions akin to serfdom. Why should they, as taxpayers, pay reparations? It's not just yet. Thank you so much. 16% of the British population is now also foreign-born. So why should they pay for reparations? What about the descendants of slaves living in Britain today? Why should people from Trinidad and Tobago living here pay reparations to people in Jamaica? Then again, why is the demand for reparations always focused and framed in terms of Britain? Why are no activists asking for reparations from the African states that were equally complicit in slavery? Should they not pay reparations? They provided the slaves that were transferred over the ocean and millions more slaves were kept in slavery in Africa by other Africans, just as were being transported across the Atlantic. Why does nobody ever actually speak about that unpleasant truth? What about the Arabs and the Muslims who bought and sold African slaves for centuries before the British arrived and continued to do so into the 20th century until the British and the French tried to stop it? And indeed, what about the slavery that carries on today? The International Labour Organization says that currently approximately seven in every 1,000 Africans is a slave. 10 million people. In 2017, CNN reported hundreds of slaves are sold every week in Libya. So much energy is given to historic reparation and the historic plight of slaves. I would have more time for the argument if the people were actively, actively pursuing that course of action were equally vocal about surely the far more horrendous plights of slaves today, where there are more slaves today in bondage, in slavery, than crossed over the Atlantic. So where are the protests outside the Nigerian High Commission? Where are the protests outside the embassies of Niger, which has 800,000 slaves today? What about Mali and Chad and Sudan and Cameroon? It's almost as if there's an ulterior motivation behind the call for apologies and reparations exclusively from Britain. And how far should we... No, I, I would love to, and normally I would, maybe a bit later on, but I'm getting into the swing of things now. <laughs> and how far should we take this? Should Britain seek reparations for the Barbary slaves? One million Europeans, at the same time as Africans were going over the Atlantic, one million Europeans were enslaved by the Ottoman states of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And it carried on after the abolition of the slave trade by the British. Should Britain demand reparations from North Africa? Of course not. It's time to move on, and so should we. But let's turn away from slavery and expand our view to colonialism more broadly. What disadvantage has colonialism actually caused to those living in the former British colonies of the Caribbean? And disadvantage compared to whom? And this is to go back to the point that you asked. Most of the former colonies of the Caribbean are now successful middle-income countries. The GDP per head of the Bahamas is higher than Portugal and is comparable to Spain and Italy. You never hear that, do you? Barbados, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis and other former British slave colonies have higher rankings on the UN's Human Development Index 
in Brazil, Mexico, and many other Spanish-speaking South American countries. How has the British Empire disadvantaged the Caribbean nations? It's not clear to me. But let's test this further, and let's go and look and compare the nations of the Caribbean with modern West Africa, the original homelands of Caribbean slaves, to see what life is like there. GDP per capita in Benin is $1,430. In Barbados, it's $17,000, over 10 times higher. Life expectancy in Benin is 62. In Barbados, it is 79. So rather than writing checks to well-off areas of the world, why not focus on countries and areas that are actually impoverished and require aid? Financial aid not attached to alleged attempts to cleanse one's soul. It can't, it can't be clearer. While slavery was abhorrent for those who were enslaved, had they stayed in Africa, the lives of their descendants today would be unquestionably worse. So what exactly, actually, is Britain being asked to pay reparations for? Because Britain wasn't the first empire in Africa, in the India, in the Americas, but it was the most benign, and, ben and the benefits from it far exceed those, for example, of the Islamic and Indian empires that carved up India, of the Ashanti Empire, of the Dahomey Kingdom, and all of the hundreds and thousands of slaves that were ritually sacrificed every year in Benin. And the Benin Bronzes were mentioned. The Benin Bronzes commemorates those who actually owned slaves. So whilst on, one, on the one hand, I can understand why you would protest Coulson's statue, why is there a celebration of the Benin Bronzes when they also commemorate slave owners? Yes, please. And I find this argument very interesting. 40%, you're quite right, 40% of the budget was spent on freeing the slaves by paying off their owners. But the practical reality was the abolition of the slave trade would never have happened had it not been for that. Because of those 3,000 slave owners, for many of them, that was their only source of income and investment. And it would never have passed through Parliament. No, but one has to be actual and practical. If you want to abolish slavery, one has to compromise, and that was how it was done. The slave trade didn't fuel the Industrial Revolution. The slave trade was abolished far too early. Only 5% of GDP was, a, was, a, was allied with the slave trade. So why are we apologizing for Britain? Are we apologizing to Britain for introducing nutrition and food storage policies that led to a decline in the subcontinent's processes of famine that happened every 40 years in India there was a famine? The population of India soared from 170 million to 450 million over the course of the Raj because of medicine, health, and accurate and proper nutritional standards and food storage compared to how it had been. There had never been in history of India such a surge in population growth. And let's not forget also what Britain did for women's rights because I think it's fair to say that it's thanks to the British Empire that we have had the progression of women in Africa and India through society. Because, of course, India's history is one of female oppression. It was the British who abolished Suti, the burning of widows on the funeral pyre of their husbands. It was the British that stopped the infanticide of young girls. And it was the British who allowed Hindu widows to remarry. I'm sorry if you don't like the facts, but facts are actually facts. Universities were brought into Africa and India by the British. It's quite... A there will, be no, there will be no system of democratic legislatures within these re regions. As Steven Pinker has written, pre-state societies before the British Empire arrived were on average far more violent than even the most brutal of modern states. So whilst many wrongs were committed in the 19th and 20th centuries, the modern success of Britain's former colonies today in the 21st century is due in large part to their colonial inheritance. The English language and the common law that enabled them to become global players, their civic institutions, the police, the military, the civil service, the judiciary, parliament, universities, every region of the world you go to, British colonies are the ones most likely to be the most developed, the wealthiest, and the most democratic. I therefore have no opposition in opposing tonight's motion 
but I'd like to end by quoting the great black civil rights activist and socialist Bayard Rustin, a friend of Martin Luther King Jr.'s and posthumous recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama, who said, if my great-grandfather picked cotton for 50 years, then he may deserve some money, but he's dead and gone, and nobody owes me anything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafe. Order! I sense there's a lot of passion on this topic, so I think as many floor speeches as possible on the motion. Uh, starting with proposition, and I'll go to you in the front. Right, okay, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. So to start off, I think I'd like to address some of the points made by opposition, right? So the second speaker for opposition mentioned the very successful examples of Caribbean countries of, uh, what was it again, uh, Barbados, right? And he compared it to the state of things in Benin. But what really confuses me is that Benin too was also colonized. And it was colonized by the French and it was treated much more brut and it was also, it was treated much more brutally under colonialism. So I'm not sure what, the, the reason why Benin is so poor today is precisely because of neo-colonialism by the French and by colonialism in the past. So I'm not sure what exactly you're getting at here. So, um, and furthermore, what really boggles my mind is that the second speaker from, from uh, opposition has simply failed to mention much wider ramifications of colonialism, right? He, he didn't mention, he mentioned how, how, the, how Barbados managed to succeed despite its colonial past, but he doesn't mention how, how, how the, the nations of the Indian subcontinent, right? Like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh remain some of the poorest countries in the world today precisely because of colonialism. So if we look at India in 1948, right, Jawaharlal Nehru in his book, uh, hang on, sorry. Jawaharlal, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India, wrote in his book, uh, let's see, sorry, give me a moment. <laughs> right, but anyway, the point, the point to be made here is, shortly after the decolonization of India, he, Jawaharlal Nehru realized that the regions of India that were colonized the longest had the highest correlation with poverty. And in the 19th century, Britain, under, under, Britain undertook a deliberate effort to de-industrialize India in order to keep her own manufactured goods competitive in the Raj. So I simply fail to see how opposition's case is a matter of fact. If anything, they are cherry picking facts to support their argument. And. Furthermore, um, there is, there is, I do think I have a solution to um, what the first speaker of the opposition mentioned about who pays, who pays for, who pays compensation, right? So what about the elite, of the, what about the British elite, right? What about the people who benefited the most from colonialism? What about the large companies like British Petrol or ExxonMobil who benefited from the colonialism, from the colonialism of say Iran, for example? So I think there are many solutions to the points that they have mentioned and Furthermore, they have simply failed to point out many, many more examples of, a co how co of the living ramifications of colonialism today. If we look at, like, say, Rwanda, for example, right, as, 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 short, as, short, as recently as 1994, they were fighting a civil war in Rwanda. And the reason for that was because of the borders drawn by the British and the ethnic tensions that, that ensued. So if, if you really think that the, the legacies of empire are over and that our, our responsibility as a nation towards the, the developing world has ceased, then you are sorely mistaken. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. I'll never, um, the abstention said, if you'd like to speak, please give your name and college before you do so. Um, just in the gray on the third row. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, Zachary Marsh, Robinson College. Um, I thought it was very interesting that the two sides of this debate tonight haven't agreed on much, but both have had in common a remarkable um, ahistoricism to what they have said. I mean, anyone who's fought through the HAP paper, the History Tripos at Cambridge, and has stumbled late at night into a library and opened up David Lowenthal's book, The Past is a Foreign Country, they do things differently there, will understand the fundamental tension here. And both sides have spoken in very different ways about teaching history in schools. And as someone who has taught histories in school, I can actually say that both of them are completely wrong about what we do. Um, 
one side seems to think that we're, we're sort of trailing out this war on woke, um, whatever the hell that means, I don't know. Um, and the other side is sort of suggesting that we're trying to brainwash kids that the British Empire was the best thing since sliced bread. The reality is that anyone who goes looking for answers in history is doomed to find none because history teaches us nuance and history teaches us that things are infinitely more complicated. And unlike either side, I'm not trying to say that means that the empire was all right and had just a few bad moments, that it was bad but had some good moments. I'm not trying to make any judgment call on that whatsoever. I'm saying that history is not something you can weaponize. No one in this room can up possibly understand the thoughts of people who operated 200 years ago. I want to point you, for example, towards Steven Spielberg's film Armistad, which I don't know if any of you have seen. It follows the journey of slaves who rose up on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that fought a famous court case in the United States for their freedom. It's well known that the slave Sinke, who led the slave rebellion, on his return to Africa, became a slave trader. That's not a verdict on that man. That's not a verdict on anybody. That is a verdict on different attitudes in history, and when we attempt to apply them in the present day, we are inevitably failing. So I'm not saying that you can't believe that reparations are not the right thing because we have a debt in the present, and I thought the speaker over there put it very rightly to argue from the present, but we should not argue from the past, because if we look to people who have tried to draw a straight line through history to a present, at best that has been foolhardy, and at worst it has been terribly dangerous. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now over to the, absten uh, to the opposition side. You've been very persistent, so I'll... Okay. Hi, my name is Kate. I'm from Wolfson. Wolfson is named after Lord Wolfson of Marylebone. He was a philanthropist. I love philanthropists. As a preface, um, I want to first of all acknowledge that there were a lot of things that were said on the opposition side that I actually agree with. It is true that slavery existed in different forms in different societies, a fact that was taken as granted even in Aristotle's theories of society as well as Hegel's exploration of the master-slave dichotomy. We are Cambridge students, so we probably don't need a history lesson. But I want to raise a question, which is, what is the purpose of history? Well, in my adopted faith of Judaism, um, our ambition is tikkun olam. Uh, this roughly translates to repairing the world by any means necessary. Um, tonight is also the anniversary of the Crystal Knot, in which, um, which translates to the Night of Broken Glass, in which Jewish homes, hospitals, and businesses in Germany were damaged, destroyed, and over 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and incarcerated, unjustly so, of course. And it, it was horrible. <laughs> and in addition to that, um, in addition, in, in response to that, Jews have actually taken on as a, as a chosen people, which I use loosely to repair the world, a, a responsibility that a marginalized group has embraced. And so what do we do, the rest of us? Um, I just came back from a talk on zakat held by the Islamic society. Um, zakat refers to charitable giving. Charitable giving, um, of course, is done with good faith and not with resentment. And any money that is paid should always be paid in good faith and not resentment, in my humble opinion. But what is the good faith for? In other words, how does that good faith benefit those who will be paying um, the reparations? In uh, the book Discourses on, Civil uh, Discourses on Colonialism, black French author Ayam Cesari says, what am I driving at, at this idea that no one colonizes innocently, that no one colonizes with impunity either? that a nation which colonizes, that a civilization which justifies colonization and therefore force is already a sick civilization, a civilization that is morally diseased, that irresistibly progressing from one consequence to another, one repudiation to another, calls for its Hitler, I mean its punishment. I am happy to oppose the motion that this how should pay reparations because I believe that everyone should pay reparations. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Moving into a second round of floor speeches, all those in favor of the motion? Uh, in the second row in the white jacket. Uh, I'm Hyung from Peter House. Um, may I just tell what I don't want to hear from the opposition side for the second speaker? Um, 
I wouldn't really want to glorify the British Empire. Um, I heard the second speaker of the opposition saying that before the pre-state, um, they established the hospitals, the railroads for the um, pre-stated colon colonial states, and um, that exactly is a racism, right? Like um, thinking that us, um, the colony colonialized states were nothing before the colony actually happened. So please, 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 please don't say that British Empire did a good job for the colonial, <laughs> um, for the next argument, please. Thank you. And moving to abstention, you were very quick in the black face, yes. Uh, name a college for the record, please. Tamara Katz. Um, there's been a lot of focus on kind of individual monetary reparations and the lasting legacies. When we talk about colonialism and empire, I'd also like to be really like annoying and abstract and conceptual, but talk about like structural practices and also mindsets like culturally. So structurally, I just want to talk about colonial legacies in terms of the normalization of plundering another nation, considering it that it can be kind of like, you know, quartered and drawn for resources. And this is a practice that is still maintained today, not only you know, this is maintained globally. There are a lot of different powers doing this. But as a, in a position of power that the West does have, perhaps we can talk about their power to propel normative changes in terms of codes of international conduct and how nations treat one another. As has been noted, many different groups have engaged in, uh, in colonialism, and, but many different groups still repeat those colonial practices today. In that same vein, what was accompanying the structural practice of you know, pillaging these countries and exploiting their labor and maintaining market dominance and so on was a psychological belief, the you know, racial legitimation of such an action, that certain groups of people are inferior to others and it is okay to use these people as less than human to achieve your desired economic ends. So if we take these two in enduring legacies of colonialism, which I think are some of the most powerful and some of the most influential on international conduct today. Maybe we can shift the talk about reparations, not to only include individual monetary reparations, which I'm not going to speak on that just because I don't know enough about that. But when we talk about structural institutional practices, when we look about, for example, imbalances in the funding allocated for research on climate change and so on and so forth, maybe we can consider what responsibility powerful nations have in terms of re well, paying reparations, I guess, more structurally and normatively with looking at the codes of conduct they set out. We still see many countries in the world today, you know, Libya, Yemen, Syria, which are literally treated as being quartered up for resources and squabbled over by multiple vying uh, hegemonic powers, some of those in our own region. So I think we need to talk about maybe how we can deal with colonial legacies in terms of the practices that it normalizes and the beliefs that it makes supposedly acceptable. And maybe that could be a more productive discussion, not that this one hasn't been not that it hasn't been, but uh, maybe we can have a more productive discussion about how that could impact the lives of people today without getting into squabbles over which was the in-group and which was the out-group and bandying statistics and so on. Thanks. And for our final floor speech of the evening, I'd like a speech in that opposition of the motion, please. You were very quick on the hand in the blue suit. Name and college, please. Alper Ardo Bustos Arman, uh, Homerton College. Now, I know that you all want to boo the, boo the opposition and clap whenever the proposition says something very good, but I would want to say that this entire, uh, this entire motion is, is very relative. I oppose how this is, uh, how this is worded because clearly the way of uh, pay, rep repaying reparations, isn't the way to go. 
because it directly counters the uh, the proposition's argument of uh, how we should uh, not delve into the past but look into the future, and it also sorry, and <clears throat> it also uh, creates a clear uh, clear problem for for both sides. So the first two proposition speakers stated that we have been going around in circles and we have to move from the past and fade the future. The two opposition speakers say that no one today is a direct victim or benefiter from the transatlantic slave trade. To look at, uh, uh, take a look at this room. The membership fee is 230 pounds. I mean, I would say that people who can afford this and be here are privileged. And if you want to also think that who, uh, that who, uh, that there is no one that benefits today from transatlantic slave trade. Well, how many people here are from dif different ethnicities? How many people in Cambridge University can pay the international fee of th over 30,000 pounds? There are, there are obvious parts in, in current, uh, sorry. There, there are obvious problems in today's world, and they're direct, uh, and they're directly affected by the roots of slave, the roots of slaverism. Now, the, the American proposition student speaker said that he's proud to be an American, and he's proud of D-Day, the reparations to were Japanese. I hereby ask whereabouts of reparations for Afghanistan, Vietnam, Iran, and any, every other current nation that has been tormented by the USA in a very recent history. That goes for the UK as well. Now, I am Turkish, and if you were to rephrase the motion in a form that resonates with my people, it would be, this house would pay reparations for the Armenian genocide. Can you please clap if you agree? It's dead. Okay, there we go. Um, now, if we had a Turkish audience, this will be completely the opposite. If you were to ask a Turkish per uh, person, I assure that over 90% would say, what genocide? Do you mean the forced movement of Armenian uh, rebels? If Britain were to return the artifacts to Turkey, they would end up, end up in attics. Turkey displays only 5% of its artifacts. And constantly, if you were to pay any sum of money, Erdogan would just go buy himself a new sink. So my general point uh, uh, would be that we have to uh, uh, we have to physically change the, uh, the meaning and uh, and the uh, means by which we actually provide uh, by we actually provide the reparations. Returning any form of artifacts or paying any sum of money will uh, will not uh, would only uh, would only counter uh, the, fa uh, the fact of moving, moving to the future. However, this university, as it's an, uh, as an education, as institution of education, what we can do, in my opinion, is we can provide uh, funds, scholarships, or, uh, or designated programs for, uh, for students or from uh, people of all kinds that have been uh, affected by the uh, British slave trade or by course, uh, in any, any other nation. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a passionate set of full speeches from all sides. Moving to our final paper speakers, I'd like to invite Dr. Mira Sabaratnam to the floor. Mira is a reader in international relations at SOAS University of London. Her research focuses on the colonial and post-colonial dimensions of world politics, and her book, Decolonizing Intervention, seeks to criticize the current model of development aid. Mira, you have the ears of the house. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's a delight to speak amongst such august company, and um, I'll try not to repeat the points that others have said. In bringing the proposition to a close to say that this house would pay reparations, I'm going to start by acknowledging that con colonialism and the, actually empire itself was enormously complex. It had a large variety of forms, right, from the East India Company formation to the settler colonial project in Australia, from uh, the Royal African Company working in West Africa, from direct rule where it worked and indirect rule where it didn't, from forms of uh, mandate that went from uh, direct rule to um, trusteeship. 
we have a whole panoply of governance forms that take place over centuries. And they're innovative and they evolve and they depend on the responses of the local population and how responsive they are to the imperial projects there. But let us not confuse the diversity of projects and the numbers of intermediaries through which they worked from their structural logic, right? The structural logic of empire everywhere, no matter its form, was to render the people, the land, the territories, and the commodities relatively cheap and relatively disposable in order to return the profits to Britain or the metropole in some way. Britain did this, France did this, Belgium tried to get in on the act with less success. But there was a clear structural logic to all of it, and that is why in the 200 years that Britain uh, uh, was the kind of primary imperial power in India, Indian GDP per head was actually pretty constant. It didn't grow very much. Britons grew enormously. Uh, the economist Dutzer Patnaik has calculated the value of the drain from India across 200 years as being at around $45 trillion, right? And that is through uh, labor paid below a, a, an a appropriate rate. That is through the forms of unequal exchange, paying cheap for the commodities that you have, the invention of taxes that you then have to pay. Then you have to sell yourself into debt bondage in order to play it. So yes, slavery may have been abolished, but people were still indentured and effectively bound to work for a particular employer or master until they paid that debt. Uh, it was off. Yes, I'll take that. So this is Pat Naik trying to put a monetary value on things like unequal exchange. So of course the global GDP won't reflect that because it reflects the depressed prices which people are paying for those goods, right? So they're not worth anything. <laughs> but the, the methodology that Pat Naik is using and other people like Hickel are using is trying to find an appropriate estimate for that. Thank you. So this is a clear structural logic and India is one part of the story. And by the way, they are asking for reparations. India is asking for reparations. Pakistan recently, with the devastating floods that caused so much loss of life, asked for reparations for climate change, right? So it's not just a fashionable thing about Africa. So why might we want to pay reparations? This house should pay reparations because we are a society organized by inheritance. We inherit our wealth. We inherit our culture, we inherit our income, we inherit our station in life, we inherit identities. That's not to say we are only what we inherit, but we are so largely what we inherit that the fact of the transatlantic slave trade is still very much felt today. Actually, I was reading today uh, an econ economist who calculated the very clear differentials between, uh, in America, the um, African Americans who were in the North and therefore freed relatively early compared to those in the South. And there are clear disparities today in their um, access to education and in their income rates. So you see that in America, and I'm sure if you did similar studies elsewhere, you would see that impact today. And we know, of course, that wealth is inherited, and we can see that very clearly from the uh, legacies of British Slave Ownership Project, for example, we, where we just happen to have a ledger with all of the money that was paid out to the slave owners. But we can find other kinds of um, inheritance. Now, the point about the British Empire is that it inherited lots of assets, but it does not want to inherit the liabilities, right? It does not want to inherit the responsibilities. It's happy to hold on to the property and the wealth, but then it doesn't want to actually accept the responsibilities that come with it. And like, as the speaker at the back said, if you're going to take pride in things, if you're going to take credit for things, then an appropriate amount of responsibility is required. And it is collective, it's not individual, it's not about finding the sp precise necessary descendant. And everybody who's asking for reparations from the governments around the world to campaign groups are not asking for individuals unless they're easily identifiable in the case of, say, Kenyan uh, torture victims. What they're asking for is a collective reparation because of the collective harm, right? Because of the collective responsibility and the collective relative benefit that has been experienced by those countries who did practice colonialism successfully in the recent past. So what are we thinking about here? So the philosopher Olufemi uh, Taiwo uh, has recently written a great book called Reconsidering Reparations, in which he pushes past not just, if you like, a transactional tort law understanding of what reparations are, and that's never really been at the heart of the, the political campaign, but it's not just about direct harm, it's not just about repairing relationships, it's about systemic transformation, and it's saying, what kind of world do we live in because of global racial uh, empire and global racial capitalism, and what kind of world can we live in? How can we change that world? 
The Benin bronzes is an interesting story. And yes, it's interesting that bronzes were looted um, in a punitive military expedition and then are in museums around the world. It's actually more interesting when you ask the story, why was there a punitive military expedition in the Benin area in 1897? And the reason is because the local elites had the temerity to oppose the monopoly on palm oil being uh, asserted by the Royal Niger Company, which was a royal chartered company, couldn't really deal in slaves anymore in West Africa because that would have been abolished. They were looking for other goods, other markets. And the Industrial Revolution, all the machines of Britain, they needed lubricating. They needed oil. And palm oil was your best lubricant. And it turned out that palm oil was really useful for loads of other products. So, of course, the enterprising British go out and they demand a monopoly on the palm oil. And the Crown says, yes, we will, we will back your monopoly and we will punish those who stand in your way. And so they get the monopoly on palm oil and that... Um, continues and the Royal Niger Company eventually becomes the United Africa Company and that is eventually sold to Unilever who continue to sell you various palm oil containing products today who maintained the assets that were gained through that period. Unilever's profits last year, $9 billion, right? How much of that is going to the peoples who were dispossessed who probably continue to work on palm oil plantations for a very low wage? So what colonialism and the empire has, yes? How much do you pay for your chocolate? Right? How much do we pay for products that come from a very long way away, which are produced by very poor people who are much worse off than even the poorest in Britain in, in many cases? And we can do that, not because we are individually bad people, but because enormous systems exist which keep that system of unequal exchange in place, right? And this is the point of my speech. So I'm running out of time, so I'm going to cut forward to asking, can we change this system of unequal exchange in a reparative spirit? And this is what reparations means, really fundamentally. Can we change this system where people and planet are made disposable, where we've normalized the violent extraction of uh, goods across distances as the way in which to organize our world and our economies? What kind of other world is possible? Well, we can start with some of the demands that have been made for debt cancellation, for the construction, the urgent construction of a green infrastructure in terms of energy. We can think about the intellectual property regimes that mean that even though India can manufacture vaccines for wealthy uh, pharmaceutical companies of the north, they can't actually vaccinate their own people, right? This is a crime and it's completely unnecessary and it's underpinned by the logic that underpinned colonialism. So I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but I'm saying that in the context of a conversation about reparations, we have an opportunity to really remake the world and to say, actually, that system in which we said that all of those people were disposable, in which their humanity didn't matter, their resources didn't matter, in which they can just grow one crop forever and then import their stuff expensively from us, that system has to change. So I put it to you that we would pay reparations. Yes, there's compensation due for specific harms and specific acts. Yes, we can restore objects to their rightful uh, places of uh, heritage. And yes, we can repair relationships with apologies and symbols of repair. But we can go further. We can transform this world and think instead of killing our planet and holding on to what aboutery and what about the Ottomans and what about the Mongols, we can say, look, the way we organize the world is messed up. It's messed up because we've got this hierarchy, and we can do something about that. So I would urge you all to vote for the proposition to pay reparations. Thank you so much, Miro, for that speech. I move now to our final speech of the night and to Henry Buxton. Henry is a first year undergraduate student reading history at St. John's College. He won the right to speak through open audition. Henry, the floor is yours.
Thank you, Madam President. I should like to open my speech this evening with some qualifications, and I will be disagreeing with some of what you've heard from your position so far. The fact that I'm opposing the motion that this House would pay reparations does not mean that I deny the horrendous suffering endured by millions of colonial subjects, nor that that suffering continues to have an influence today. For me, the heinous crimes of the British Empire are not up for debate tonight, and nor should they be. There is, in my opinion, <laughs> there is, in my opinion, an issue underlying this debate on which both sides should fundamentally agree that work should be done in the present to confront the injustices of the past. The disagreement lies in how this might be done. I'd like to ask what is perhaps a painfully obvious question. Why are there calls for Britain to pay reparations? To my mind, there are two principal reasons. To apologize for historical abuses of colonial subjects, and secondly, so that the effects of that abuse can, as far as possible, be eradicated in the present. Yet, Britain can apologize sincerely for imperial crimes without monetary payment to its former colonies. Reparations are also not the best way of resolving historical iniquities that persist today. My case consists of three strands of argument against the payment of reparations. That they are utterly impractical, that they are a superficial approach to addressing historical injustices, and lastly, that they have the incorrect focus. Paying reparations for Britain's crimes might at first seem a simple and just course of action. But this course of action is one that breaks down as soon as one considers its practical execution. Perhaps the most fundamental consideration is to whom reparations should be paid. On what grounds should people receive reparations and how should this be verified? A possible response is that everyone who is a colonial subject of the British Empire is entitled to reparations and that this right could be checked with reference to historical records such as census data. However, by their very nature... Yes. So the second speaker has, of opposition has given you a model where it wouldn't be money being given back, it's just an apology to set and reset the global power dynamics that it was on the global north. A third speaker has just given you a real example with a pathway to speak to you, Eva. Why don't you engage with their examples rather than make up your own? I, I will be engaging with those arguments later on in my, my speech. Historical records, by their very nature, are imperfect, and so some people's right to reparations might be missed. Moreover, this approach is plainly flawed because people suffering under the British Empire was unequal. The corollary of this is that some people should be paid different amount of reparations to others. But attempting to quantify human suffering is a reductive exercise that would be doomed to failure. Proponents of reparations, as they have this evening, might uh, propose a different form of payment in the guise of a lump sum to formal colonial powers. However, this approach is played by the issue of how individuals' interests will be represented when it came to the distribution of such a payment. The payment of reparations, as has been slightly differently argued by a fellow member of the opposition, also begs the question of what span of the past they should cover. Paying reparations would leave us teetering on the edge of an infinite regress, I'll take that. We're in this position right now because we've been unfairly trying to decide how other countries should rule and govern their own people. Are you suggesting that Britain should try and impose their own will on how other countries will distribute reparations as well? I'm not suggesting that at all. What I'm, what I'm going to suggest later in my speech is that reparations are not actually the most effective measure by which we can change the... Um, Power, power imbalances and uh, power structures that already exist as a result of colonialism. Yes. However, Britain has benevolence from the time of the British Empire. Some of the time, I think the answer to that is self evident, is it not? <laughs> I'll carry on, I'll, I'll come back to points of information later. The sad fact is that 
If it were decided that Britain should pay reparations for every historical injustice that we have perpetrated in our recent history, we would never stop paying. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So far, I have laid out the practical case against reparations, but my objections also concern their problematic nature. The payment of reparations inherently carries the implication that money can resolve historical oppression and its present-day effects. The idea that money is some sort of miraculous panacea permeates our society today. Of course, there are certain issues that money can resolve. However, historical oppression is not one of them. Monetary payments to the people of former colonial territories might improve their situation in the short term. However, the structural imbalances and barriers to their development to prosperity would still exist because money alone cannot remove these barriers. Uh, yes. I don't. I don't think that's actually relevant to the issue because. To okay. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I think that, that put forms part of my argument, which is that if we were constantly trying to address the balance of the past, it's not the way about to go about that. And I'll address later in my speech, we should be looking forward to the future. That's not to say, as I shall mention, that we should negate the influence of the past. <coughs> and also, I think I really like to dissociate the notion that because I'm on the opposition that I'm proud or in some way believe that slave owners should have been given reparations, that of course they shouldn't. But that's not the issue that I'm going to be addressing. That's not how I'm going to attempt to uh, persuade you to vote for side opposition this evening. Reparations are, in actual fact, in my opinion, a superficial measure, one that encourages an indolent attitude that once Britain has paid its fee, it can wash its hands of its imperial crimes and need take no further action. Yeah, okay, I'll get involved down here. My response to that would be that I, I, I'd argue why, why would you want a superficial resolution to the problem? Why would you not want to force Britain and other former imperial powers to address this issue head on? And for me, you, you may disagree with me, in which case go ahead and vote side proposition, but for me, the, the, way to, the way to address these issues is not by simply throwing money at them. It is by addressing them structurally. It's by a partnership with Britain and its former colonies and any other former imperial power to work together to make the world a better place. In, yes. How are these powers supposed to work together if we can't even admit the harm being done by the government? Now, the now this, this is a point that's very important. I'm not, for me, the, a sincere apology does not have to take the form of monetary reparations. We can debate the fact whether the British government or any other imperial power has given such an apology, but for me it is not necessary for that, for that apology to take the form of money. It can take the form of a declaration and speech. I'll go on, Sam, I'm feeling brave. I think that just because, just because exploitation took a monetary form in the past does not necessitate or determine that reparation has to take monetary form in the present. And I, I hesitate to say this, but I think reparation can take a different form in the present of partnership and cooperation to make the world a better place, which, again, I will get on uh, to later in my speech. To, no, no, I need to get through it now, I'm sorry. The payment of reparations also establishes a troubling relationship between Britain and its former territories. The notion that Britain should apologize through the deployment of its greater economic wealth maintains the idea that its ex-colonial powers continue to be diminutive and impotent victims, one that I believe inhibits any resolution of structural inequities. Instead of merely paying money, which is the point I'm now getting on to, uh, 
British, British, uh, Britain should work in equal partnership with its former colonies to dismantle structural barriers to their progression to prosperity. For example, this could take the form of closer trading partnerships, welfare projects, and initiatives to increase employment opportunities. I, I now move to my final point, that reparations have the wrong focus. They look back in the past in despair, rather than forward in future, in hope for the future. Towards the beginning of my speech, I identified two reasons for the payment of reparations, apology and improvement. Reparations prioritize the apology rather than the resolution of the present day problems which persist as a specter of British imperialism. I propose that the improvement of today's situation is the most important part of Britain's apology for its imperial abuses. No thanks, Danny. This is because an apology expresses regret for the past, but also a desire to do better in the future. Reparations encourage a fixation with the past over a commitment to work for change in the future. I can return, no thank you, I can return here to the practical process of paying reparations. To expend energy determining who should be paid how much for historical injustices is to waste it, because our energy should be focused on working for change now. This is not to say that we should forget the past or negate its significance, just that we should not be slaves to it. When the members of the House saw the title of the motion for the debate this evening, I wonder what they thought it would signify to vote no. Perhaps a denial of the crimes of the British Empire, a chauvinistic refusal to address the past, a failure to apologize for historical crimes, an avoidance of the responsibility to resolve historical injustice. Hey, thank you. I hope that I have shown that to vote no signifies none of these things. Rather, to vote no means a rejection of impracticality. To vote no means a rejection of superficial measures. To vote no means a commitment to making real and lasting systemic change for a better and more hopeful future. That is why I implore the House to oppose the motion before us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Henry, for that fine speech. And to everyone that participated tonight, be it in a floor speech, a paper speech, or point information. Um, I have a few notices for me to vote. The first is that the Haunting of Hill House, the Cambridge Union's play this term, opens tomorrow. Um, there's a QR code and a water paper, you can buy tickets here. Uh, secondly, we'll be announcing the results in the bar. If you'd like your evening to go a bit longer than that, we have a reggae speakeasy down in the cellars from 10 p.m. So do go and join, you can pay on the door. Um, but now we're moving to a vote. If you're unconvinced by either side, what's the middle door, the abstentions. Um, on the right, you've got the eyes, and on the left, you've got the nose. See you all in the bar. This is broken. Thank you. That was a great debate. Well done for organizing it.